Okay, if we'd like to turn to the Gospel of John and chapter 4. It's the Gospel of John, chapter 4. Starting to read at the beginning. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, Though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. But he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now, Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me? A Samaritan woman. For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband, in that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, And you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. And at that point, his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no one said, what, why, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? The woman then left her water pot, went away into the city and said to the men, Come see a man who told me all things I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out to the city and came to him. In the meantime his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Therefore his disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him anything to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not laboured. Others have laboured and have entered into their labours. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Saviour, of the world. Amen. Let's ask God to bless his word to our hearts today.
Heavenly Father, again, it's a great responsibility to stand here to deliver your word. It's not a natural word, it's a supernatural word. As our brother said earlier, sent down from heaven. And I pray, Lord, that you will move from our heart to heart, Lord, today, to encourage us, Lord, to strengthen us, to bolster up our faith, Lord, until we see you face to face. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, God has left this world in no doubt that he exists. If a man or woman decides not to believe in a creator, then let their ignorance be on their own be their own downfall. You see, the fool has said in his heart that there is no God. When the Bible's open with in the beginning, God. You see, a man is a fool if he tries to explain why you're living God. For he has been designed in a special way to have a relationship with God. And the Bible does not try to convince man that God exists. Rather, it demonstrates the life we should live because he exists. Did you get that? It demonstrates the life we should be living because he exists. He was here before us. He's always been. Now, despite the rantings and ravings of some fanatics, possibly mad, mad men, no man has seen God, despite what man has said. No man has seen God at any time. Jesus came to reveal him. He is the expression of God. Jesus stated that I and the Father are one. Yet Philip said to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus replied, Philip, have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me? He who has seen me has seen the Father. He who has seen me has seen the Father. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Many so-called scholars spend most of their lives trying to fathom out the mystery of the triune God. That's all it takes over their lives. How come the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have a unique position in the Godhead? It's not for us to work out. Rather, we just got to accept it. God is the Father, God is the Son, and God is the Holy Spirit. Now in John's Gospel, as we've just read, chapter 4, we read of that extraordinary account of this woman at the well. It's a really tremendous story. We can glean so much from this chapter. Jesus needed to go through Samaria. His disciples had gone to buy food. But he had a plan. He had a purpose. He was on a mission. So Jesus being weary sat down at the well. How was Jesus weary? God never gets tired. Isaiah 40, 28 states that the Lord neither faints nor is weary. Yet in Jesus, in his fleshly body, was fallible to weakness. Even though he was fully God. And he being found in appearance as a man. He being in appearance as a man felt pain. He knew what, he knew what it was to thirst. He felt grief as he cried at Lazarus' tomb. He was a man. People say, ah, he went to the cross and those nails didn't really hurt him. He was God. Listen, he felt every, he felt every nail, he felt every piercing. Because he was a man, yet fully God. And a woman, an ordinary Samaritan woman, came along to draw water. It doesn't say that she was of any importance. Just an ordinary woman. And there was Jesus. There at the same time at the well. Was this a coincidence? I'd rather think that this was a divine appointment. 
This was the day that ordinary woman who do their everyday chores like gathering water was going to encounter God in the flesh. You see, before the foundation of the world, Jesus knew where and when you'd be saved. He knew you before you were born. He knew you before the foundation of the world. And he knew where and when you were going to be saved. It doesn't matter where you were saved in that hour. People have been saved under banana trees in the Pacific. They've been saved under some, some strange, in, in strange places. It doesn't matter where you've been saved. It's that you are, have been saved. Jesus came out to meet you. To reveal himself to you. He showed you that you needed a saviour. You may not have realised it. And I know I didn't realise it. Up until that time that I was heading for hell. But God in his love came to us. The light of the glorious gospel penetrated your heart. As the Holy Spirit brooded over your life. The Holy Spirit brooded over your life. Because the Holy Spirit broods over a person's life. When a person has been as when, when a person's name is in the book of life, he's there waiting. Waiting for that time that you will give your life to Christ. He knows who will give the, their lives to him. Yes. It's not a matter of you were going to hell, yeah. you were going to hell, you were going to hell, you were going to stand up here, form a line here, because you were going to heaven, and you're not, it doesn't work like that. He knew who would accept him, and he knew who would reject him. And judging by our, our, our meeting hall today, you can see that many people have rejected him. So Jesus, the Son of the living God, asks her for a drink of water. The woman must take it back. You were a Jew and you were asking me for a drink of water. You're asking me for a drink. A drink of cold water in the heat of this day. And it's a good idea. That was my cue to have a, have a drink. I'm a Samaritan. You're a Jew. We're not supposed to associate with each other. Now Jesus never said to me, now listen lady, I'm making an exception today. This is our secret meeting, okay? We're not supposed to be speaking, but this is our secret. Okay? You have permission to talk to me, okay? But just this once? Just this once? No. You know, God shows no partiality. God shows no partiality. He sees no denomination. I belong to that denomination. And I, I don't care what denomination you belong to. God doesn't see denominations. No. He doesn't differentiate whether you're a Jew, an Arab, a Gentile, a Samaritan. So what? God looks at the heart. God looks at the heart. It's only man that judges from the outside. But God looks at the heart. And Jesus said, if you knew the gift of God... And who was asking you for a drink, you would have asked him for living water. Ah, so you was the purpose of God. The conversation about water was of great spiritual significance. Because Jesus offered her living water. Water that needn't have been fetched, fetched, but would constantly refresh her spiritually. No water pot needed. No. You see, in John 7, 37, on the last day of the feast, Jesus cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, since Jesus was not yet glorified. Well, I've got some good news to tell you, brother and sister today. The Holy Spirit has come. The Holy Spirit has come. We have been sealed by the Holy Spirit. We've, we've received the spirit of adoption. But where we can cry, Abba, Father. We are spiritually unique. People.
people. For the Holy Spirit of God lives in you and he lives in me. Peter on the day of Pentecost preached that powerful message. And he said, if you repent, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. No Christian is an orphan. In fact, you cannot be a Christian without the Holy Spirit. That's true. And don't let anybody tell you different. He is the agent of salvation. It always has been and it always will be. Don't let anybody say, oh, I was saved. I put my hand up. It's the Holy Spirit that goes to work. Yeah. Goes to work. That's why 3,000 were added on the day of Pentecost to the, the church. Because the Holy Spirit went to work. The Bible says, if anyone does not have the Spirit of God, he does not belong to God. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He will give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who lives in you. Wow! Wow! I do not anybody shouting hallelujah. I've shouted for you. Hallelujah! Amen. Praise God! The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead? That's got to be some kind of misprint, surely! No. The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you and in me. Amen. What a miracle. What a miracle. They reckon the miracle is putting a man on the moon or sending him into the depths of the ocean. But let me tell you something. The most greatest miracle on earth is, is new birth in Christ. Mm. That's the greatest miracle. A man or a woman will ever receive you on earth. It's the gift of new life yeah. in Christ. Amen. It's free. It's from His grace. It doesn't have to be earned. It's just got to be accepted. That, my brother and my sister, is the greatest miracle in my opinion. You see, the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirits that we are children of God. It's better. And if children, then hairs of God, joint hairs with Christ. Joint hairs with Christ. You see, God, as I've said, is not interested in denominations. God has invested in every believer His Holy Spirit. A permanent Indwelling. Jesus said to the disciples, He will only be with you, but He'll be in you. He will be in you. No wonder the Christian life is unique. The leaves are the religious, cold and the lifeless. Because when you've got the flame of the Holy Spirit dwelling in your life, Jesus said, Jesus said, You will receive the Holy Spirit. You will receive power. That's what he said to the disciples. The dunamis. The dunamis. And we have that power. In the presence of the Holy Spirit. Within each of our lives. That permanent indwelling. Sir, the woman replied, the well is deep and I have nothing to draw water. You have nothing to draw water. How can, I, how can we get this living water? Shall I help you? Maybe the lady would have said, you don't need any help. Salvation is of grace. You don't need any human intervention. No. No, don't need to assist God. You don't need to assist God. That's works. Nobody can get to heaven by works. Everybody that will be in heaven and stands before God will be there by grace. Saved by grace alone. Amen. Nobody will stand there and say, you know what? I knew I was getting to heaven because, you know, the day I met Jesus, I'd been doing this for him and that for him. And, you know, they won't be there. No, no, no. It's by grace. Grace. Jesus said, whoever drinks of this natural water will first again... But the water I will give him, they will never thirst. 
because he's talking about a spiritual water. They'll never thirst again because it will become in him a fountain of living water springing up into everlasting life. So why don't some people then find Jesus sufficient enough? Why do they go in here and there? And why do they want, why do they want goosebump experiences? Because the word of God is not sufficient for them. Jesus is not sufficient enough for them. They want more. They're craving more. I remember when the Toronto blessing came out. And one of the leaders said, I crave more of God. No, what he was actually saying was, he craved more to have his feelings motivated. That's what he wanted. They weren't satisfied with Jesus. Yet Jesus said, you come to me and let it thirst. Religion has never helped anyone and never will. The church buildings, as lovely as they are, with their stained glass windows, is not the main function of believers. We are the church. We. And we never stop being the church. We are the body. A body that is united in the Holy Spirit. A vibrant church. A church that is radiant, alive. We are probably the only alive people around you. Except for the, the Christians. The genuine Christians out there. No amount of fleshly effort will attract the unbeliever into a church, into a fellowship. It is the spirit of the living God that will reveal the living Christ and impact our towns and our streets and our cities. It is the Holy Spirit. Why? Because he is the same today as he was then. He's the same. He's the same. And surely I do get excited when I think of the indwelling Spirit of God living in me. Sir, give me this water so that I may not thirst. I don't have to keep coming here. Jesus said, go. Go call your husband. Go and get him and come back here. She said, I've I've got no husband. I'm in a relationship, but I'm not married to this man. Jesus said, you've, you've well said you have no husband, for you've had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. You spoke truly. You see, he was drawn out of confession for that. He knew her heart. He wasn't being nasty. He was drawn out of confession. You see, we cannot hide nothing from God. His eyes examine our hearts constantly. And one day we will all stand before God to give an account of our lives to him. But for the believer, it's not a judgment of condemnation. Because there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Amen. Yes, amen. Condemnation's past. Our judgment to God. Because Jesus was judged for our sins. And when we put our faith in Christ, there, there he is. He took, he's took it our, he's took it our sins away. Mm. So we don't need to be judged. We won't be judged. Mm. The, 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 the place where we, we will be is where people will receive rewards. But no man or woman can hide nothing from God. And I wouldn't like to be in some of the, some of these people's shoes out there. The things that I've, I, I'll tell you something. The woman called him a prophet as he was telling her some home truths. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain and you Jews say that Jerusalem is the place of real worship. Jesus will not tell her that the time is coming where the geographical place where one worships won't be of no significance. The hour is coming and now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is a spirit. And they who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming. Who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Do you remember the disciples said, come on, tell us. Are you the Christ? Come on, tell us. But here it is. Here it is. This is why man's without excuse. 
I know the Messiah is coming. Then the revelation came. So unique to this woman. To this ordinary woman. I who speak to you am he. Wow. What? You're waiting for the Messiah? Here I am. Here I am. You know, all them priests that knew the Mosaic law, all them teachers that, that, that knew the scriptures, couldn't even, couldn't even tell her this. Jesus introduced himself. I'm the Messiah. Mm. Wow! And the Jews are still waiting for him. There it is. In black and white. Confessed by Jesus. That he is the Christ, the Messiah, the Saviour of the world. Yet man is still in his sin. There he is, revealing himself, openly confessing that the Messiah has come. It is I, the Messiah. I've arrived. And lady, I've chose to tell you. Plainly. I've told, I've told you this because I want to reveal myself to you. Well, that's me and you. That's me and you. Because none of us can find God. None of us, none of us have been pushed up against the one and said, you better believe that Jesus is the Messiah. You better, no. We were convinced in our hearts that he was the Messiah because he came to us. Yes. Just like that lady. My own people reject me. They don't believe in me. But I'm the Messiah. I'm the one you're speaking to. Don't go looking for another one. You're wasting your time. Mm. Here I am in the flesh. I'm God in the flesh. Mm. Wow. Can you imagine brothers and sisters being there? Mm. Wow. Mm. God in the flesh. Wow. Mm. And Jesus never judged her. Never looked at where she'd been. He looked at her potential of what she would become. Just like he sees you and he sees me. What does the Bible say? He does not treat us as our sins deserve. That's right. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. Mm -hmm. Jesus never den this denounced her for her life. This woman might have lived an immoral life. She had five husbands. But now the Christ had come to change her position. Remember the woman called in adultery? Let him who was without sin cast the first stone. The words of Jesus to this woman were prophetic. For within a hundred years of that conversation, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. And it became impossible for the Jewish people to worship there. Mm. However, before the temple was destroyed, God made alternative provision for his people to worship him he transferred the requirements from a physical location to a spiritual condition. The spiritual, the spiritual condition that Jesus stated was in spirit and in truth. That's how we are to worship God, the true worshiper. The woman had a valid encounter. Her heart had come into collision. With the revelation of the person and the will of God in Christ. He told her plainly that he was the Messiah. What a privilege. What a privilege to be told. Can you imagine for weeks later she would be telling people, He told me that I, he was the Messiah, you know. Mm. You know, can you imagine her? Can you imagine her conversation? You know, I met him by the well and he told me he was the Messiah. Mm. When a man turns back to God in repentance of faith, by rebirth, his spirit is renewed and made capable of restored fellowship with God. It is only in the spirit that we relate to God in worship. Now the church has strangely been disillusioned by this word worship. Because in my last church, worship consisted of singing a, a couple of songs, maybe a hymn, maybe a chorus, and singing it over and over a couple of times, clapping your hands. That might be an act of worship. 
That can be an act of worship. But the true worship we give God is ourselves. Worship is offering ourselves to God. To submit to his divine will. That's true worship. Daily. Our whole lives is an offering. We give our lives to God every day in submission to his will. That is true worship. Romans 12, 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that God may prove the good and acceptable will of God. You see, the Samaritan woman left her water pot behind, symbolic of leaving her old life. She wasn't interested in that water anymore. She just met the Lord. And she went into the city. And she said to the men. Notice she said to the men. Probably some of these men might have, might have even been married to her. I don't know. But she said to the men. Come and see a man who told me everything about myself. Could this be the Christ? Many Samaritans believed in Jesus because of her testimony. Come see a man. They believed. That woman had a divine encounter with God. And I want to say to those who are listening to our messages or watching our messages from, from the Berean Fellowship, I can tell you that it isn't by chance that these people are listening. They've tuned in because God has a plan for their lives. And God wants to reveal the Savior, the Messiah, to you who listen to the message. And even though you have a past, he loves you. And he wants you to have a relationship with you. Mm. You may feel insignificant. No one wants to listen to you. Jesus does. This woman was of great importance to Jesus. To other people, she was just a woman in the crowd. But to Jesus, she was special. We all need salvation. The Bible says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? How shall we escape? The people of Samaria didn't just rest on the woman's testimony about Jesus. They came to Jesus themselves. To see for themselves the Savior of the world. They said, no, we believe not because of what you've said. Oh, no, 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 no. no. But we ourselves have heard him. And we know that he is indeed the Christ, the Saviour of the world. She was, she was a vehicle of bringing other people to Christ. You see, she was a vehicle of bringing other people to Christ. What a result. Many found the Saviour and salvation for themselves. They experienced for themselves the God of creation. My friends, you know, those who listen to this message... Can I testify that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven? Mm. He sacrificed himself to bring you to God. And let me in these closing moments of this message tell you something soberly important. One day you will die and you will stand before a holy God. And if you have attended church, good. But that's not going to save you. If you sang in a choir, well done. But that's not going to save you. A person could go to hell with baptismal waters running down their face. The Bible makes it plain. In order to receive salvation and escape the reality of hell, you need to repent and call upon the Lord. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. We at the Berean Fellowship have had an encounter with God in our own time, in our own location. And we confess and testify to this world. Come see a man. Come on. Come see a man. Come and see this man. Come and see this man dying on the cross for your sin. Come and see a man. There he is. Between them other two. He who knew no sin became sin for us. Yes. 
Their mother too were guilty. But this man is innocent. Yeah, he's dying for us, look. Yeah, that's right, the one in the middle. The story of this woman drawing water at the well speaks volumes. It shows us that God loves us and cares for us in spite of our sin. He draws near. God values every one of us to actively seek us, to give us true life. He came and he actively sought us personally. Our sister mentioned earlier about the, 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 he goes out looking for the lost sheep. Yes, he does. That lost sheep might be no significant to anybody else, but to Jesus, oh yes. Mm. New life has to be born within, and that can only come by receiving Jesus Christ mm. as your Savior mm. and having a spiritual encounter with God. Mm. Jesus told the respectable religious leader, You must be born again. And the the old hymn puts it like this. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Come as you are without one plea. And the Lord will receive you and forgive you. Mm. You may have heard the gospel for years, but now today is a divine appointment. Mm. For God is passing your way. Mm -hmm. And he has something great in store for you. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart, but open up your heart to him, and you can truly say, I know for myself that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, and he is not only my Savior, but the Savior of the world. Amen, Amen. Amen. and God bless you. Amen.